Hello, Brave UXers, and a very happy new year to each and every one of you. I hope you've been enjoying some special, uninterrupted quality time with your loved ones this holiday season. When I recorded the 100th episode of Brave UX back in November of 2022, a conversation with Don Norman, I wasn't certain what the future of the podcast would be, if it even had a future. Well, having taken some time to consider how Brave UX fits in with the other aspects of my life, I'm really pleased to let you know that the show will go on, albeit at a reduced frequency. In 2023, new episodes will be lovingly delivered to you every two weeks, and there are some wonderful conversations already recorded and many amazing guests lined up. We'll be getting to the first of those shortly. But before we do that, if you're feeling generous and you've been finding Brave UX valuable, please take a moment now and leave a review on the podcast so that others can understand why. And if you're feeling even more generous, extend that moment just a little longer and share a post about the show with your LinkedIn community. If you are listening to this, there's a really good chance that people in your LinkedIn community would also find these conversations useful. Well, that's enough from me. I wish you all the very best for the year ahead. Don't forget to focus on what you can control and try to forget what you can't. Stay curious, be willing to be wrong and mean it. And most importantly, keep being brave. Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. You can find out a little bit more about that at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Jim Callback. Jim is the Chief Evangelist and VP of Customer Experience at Mural, the world's leading digital whiteboard. At Mural, Jim is a globally visible and eloquent advocate for creative collaboration. He also serves on the company's executive leadership team and is responsible for not one, but three of the company's functions, customer success, customer support, and pro services. Prior to joining Mural, Jim was a principal UX consultant at Citrix Online, and he has also worked in numerous consulting roles for other large companies such as eBay, Sony, LexisNexis, and Razorfish Germany. Somehow, on top of all of this, Jim found the time to write three critically acclaimed books. The first, Designing Web Navigation, was published in 2007, followed by Mapping Experiences in 2016, of which a new edition has just been released, and most recently, The Jobs to be Done Playbook in 2020. While working in Europe, where he spent the first 15 years of his career, Jim co-founded the popular European Information Architecture Conferences, as well as the leading UX event in Germany, the IA Conference. He has also previously served on the advisory board of the Information Architecture Institute and as an editor for Boxes and Arrows, the popular online journal for user experience that was started by Christina Vodka and is now run back by Amy Jimenez Marquez, both previous guests of the show. An excellent and thoughtful speaker, Jim has graced the stage at events such as TEDx, UX Brighton, Enterprise UX, UX Lisbon, and UX Strat, that's a lot of UXs, as well as being a guest on numerous podcasts, webinars, and at meetups. When he's not leading customer experience or contributing to the global design community in some meaningful way, Jim can be found playing jazz bass, jamming with local musicians at local festivals. But now he's here to jam with me in this conversation on Brave UX. Jim. Welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here, Brendan. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here, Jim. I have really thoroughly enjoyed looking at the wide range of talks and interviews that you've given in the past. There's definitely heaps for us to cover today. I actually want to start by winding back the clock a little bit to 1997, which is the time after you graduated Rutgers University 
with a master's in library and information science, and you moved to Germany. And as I mentioned in your introduction, you stayed there for the first 15 years of your career. That is uh, not an inconsequential amount of time. Why Germany? Yeah, um, good question. Um, at the time when I was at, in, in, at Rutgers uh, doing my graduate degree, um, I was studying German. Uh, one of the requirements for getting the graduate degree was uh, to prof- uh, pass a language profic- proficiency course. It was basically just translating. You didn't even have to speak, just translate from German into English. But I started getting into it and I actually went over to Germany and I did a, an exchange program with, with the Rutgers group. They go over every summer for like six weeks and it was immersive and I loved it over there. And then I went back the next year with the immersion with the immersion program as well, too. So I'd gone over for two extended periods of time and had been learning the language. And then after I got my degree, I thought, well, I could do this for a year, you know, before I get a real job in the U.S. And that turned into 15 years. So it was quite unplanned. But, you know, as doors open in, in your life, you know, you, you take those opportunities. And I found that I was uh, getting a lot of opportunities. Of course, that was during the dot-com boom uh, and the dot-com bust, but during the dot, dot-com boom, you know, following people like Jacob Nielsen and just, you know, what, what what was happening around, you know, the year 2000 in terms of awareness of usability, awareness of UX, you, you know, the UX started to be called a thing. And when I got to Razorfish in 2003, we had a UX department and people in, in the company who were thought leaders in the field. So there were a lot of opportunities that happened and kept me there for 15 years. You mentioned that when you got over there, doors started to open. Is yeah. there someone in particular or was there a door uh, that was open for you that comes to mind that you're particularly uh, grateful of or in retrospect has been one of those fort- fortuitous moments yeah. that you didn't quite recognize at the time? Yeah, the, I think I think there were two things. I don't know if it was a person. It was more of circumstances and events that happened. You know, from from my remote location here in the U.S., I was checking out the companies at the time, you know, agencies and web consultancies. And I, I found a small shop called ID Media. I don't think they exist anymore, actually. Uh, and that was in the south of Germany. And I went over there for about eight months. I lived just outside of Stuttgart in the middle of, middle of nowhere, in the farm country. And then they opened up an office in Hamburg. And it was, go- it was going from that rural southern German setting to then a big city. Hamburg is the second biggest city in Germany. And, and that, that, was, that, that kind of opened both personally and professionally, that opened a lot of doors. Uh, there were other agencies in town. There wasn't anything else in the small town that I was in, uh, in the south of Germany. But then suddenly there's other agencies and there's events. And there was a scene, uh, uh, kind of a, a web agency scene there as well, too. So, so that kind of opened up uh, a, a lot of doors there. And then, and then I left ID Media and went to Razorfish. And I think that was the, that was the real big event. So it was kind of ID Media kind of got me over there. But it was when I started at Razorfish that I really, in my mind, that's when I really began a career in UX. And I came in through the IA uh, side of it because they had an IA function. And having studied information science... Uh, and had a couple of years of usability, you know, uh, exposure from, you know, people like Jacob Nielsen, and I did a couple of usability tests uh, early on. Uh, you know, IA just seemed like the right place for me to be in 2003 with Razorfish to be an information architect. I, I felt like I was at home, and I just dug my heels in. I was, I was, I was all in on everything that was going on in the scene reading about it, uh, you know, attending events, that that whole thing. Of course, that kind of morphed into UX for me. Uh, and there's semantic differences between IA and usability and UX, but UX is being a slightly bigger kind of umbrella that attracted me as well, too. But I think it was moving the Razorfish career-wise. It was moving the Razorfish that really kind of set me off. And then personally, it was moving to the big city. You know, this investment that you did make in Europe and then coming back to the States when you did after 15 years, was it difficult for you to say goodbye and to close that chapter on all of the relationships and the energy that you'd put into that region? Mm. To some degree, but um, hmm, not really. Uh, I never I never thought about that. I think, I think it was time to move on and it was right for lots of other reasons in my life. 
personally and professionally. And you know, one of the very satisfying things with you know the Euro- European Information Architecture Conference, for instance, you know, by the time I left Europe, it had been going for over a decade, and it was it was self sustaining, right? There were there were other people that kind of took that over. Same with the Information Architecture Conference in Germany. Uh, that's with a K, right? The German word for conference, um, and it, it kind of had a life of its own. Another thing that I actually didn't put on my resume um, that you didn't mention was um, in Hamburg, where I was. I actually was the founder of the uh, the local. We called it a usability roundtable. I think is what we called it in in English. We used the word roundtable, usability roundtable, and the same thing happened there. I think it's still going to this day. I think there's still a group. In Hamburg, Germany, I think they renamed it, but it's essentially that same continuum of professionals coming together in a very informal meetup kind of way. Um, so, it, you know, at the time, uh, you know, I just saw all of these all of these motions that got started, and I didn't. I, I I did it because I wanted to give back to the community, and I wanted to be part of the community, and I didn't have any ulterior motive. Certainly, wasn't wasn't making money from it or anything like that. But it was just very satisfying to see that those things had enough uh, momentum that they were self-sustaining. And I think at the time, um, it, it was uh, it was a good time to, to say goodbye to it all, I think, yeah. Mm. This idea of major career changes or transitions or points in our lives where it's maybe patently evident or maybe not that it's time to make it make a change and go in a different direction, is this when you reflect on your career and where you are now from the position that you hold now, were these always obvious to you and easy for you to navigate? Or has mm. this been something that was murky at best at the time, in particular maybe this transition back to the US, um, mm. and that you've had to feel your way through? You know, What sort of insight or, or advice or self-reflections have you had about these significant shifts for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I, I like a lot of certainty with my job and my career. And I think the one thing, particularly in the time period that we're talking about, right, you know, 2000 something until 2015 or whatever was was kind of a heyday for UX and usability and IA and all these things were flourishing. So even though I enjoy a lot of security in my own career and my own job, being in that field at that time provided a certain comfort and safety net just because... It was so hot and so many people were hiring. You you literally felt like you could go out on a limb and and try some try something new, which which I didn't do too often actually, but I, I probably could have done it even more that is switch jobs or something like that. Um, but I tended to stay put fairly long, uh, not not forever, but I did stay put. But you still had this feeling like your skills were marketable, and there would always be something else coming around the corner, and and there always was as well too. So as uncertain as I was to to make the changes, career changes, moving from ID Media to Razorfish, and then I moved from Razorfish to to LexisNexis. As you know, uncertain as you are in those in those moments, it was bound to work out, <laughs> uh, just because there was there's so much. The, the whole field was growing, right? And there was a lot of attention on it. And of course, at that time, I started writing and speaking as well too. So I started to get attention. So you start you start building up a little bit of confidence as well too uh, through that. At least I did. Yeah. Mm. Almost sounds like you're referring to the field and the past tense in terms of its heyday. Now, it's, yeah. it's obvious to anyone <laughs> in the sector at the moment that there are massive layoffs going on at very significant employers of uh, the talent that is in our field. Is this something in your perspective that is just a blip and we're going to go through another resurgence? Mm. Or is this a marked change in the way in which particularly the tech industry views the talent, not just in UX, but also engineering and other disciplines right. and, yeah. and, and what we've got to look forward to or not look forward to in mm. the future? I, I think a lot of what's going on right now is actually rather driven by the macroeconomic uh, conditions. And I don't think it's a, a reflection, certainly not an indictment on you know those fields that you just mentioned. So I don't see I don't see those fields uh, diminishing or dwindling. They might start plateauing though because you know there was a time where hiring somebody with senior UX skills in Silicon Valley was almost impossible, right? 
Uh, and if you had those skills, you could pretty much work anywhere that you wanted. So it might not be those conditions, but I still think if you have marketable skills, you know, maybe a degree these days, we didn't have degrees back in those days, but now that you can actually go study UX and interaction design and things like that. If you have, if you, if you're armed with a diploma and you have some experience, you, you you will be able to find your way. I'm confident of that. You might not be able to pick and choose and demand a higher salary and all that kind of thing, but you'll you'll definitely find your way. So I don't I don't think it's diminishing to the point where you know you, you won't be able to make it or that you won't be able to find a job. So may, maybe there's a plateau. Maybe the economic macroeconomic conditions and the layoffs that you just mentioned maybe that marks a plateau. But I don't I don't I don't see things diminishing per se or at least the demand for those skills. Let's put it that way. How critical has your public speaking and the three books that you've written been to your ability to stand head and shoulders over other candidates? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't, I don't know actually, because I've never hired me. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know what my resume looks like next to other folks resumes. Uh, at least when I was, I, I don't really practice UX anymore. I, I have to admit, right? I'm not on a UX team right now. I kind of shifted when I came to Miro. So I haven't really been a designer or in the design field since well, almost a decade now, um, since 2013. But let me think. So then when I was at LexisNexis, so I was at LexisNexis for nine years, and that's when I wrote my first book. And then uh, my second and third books actually came out when I was here at Miro, now that I think about it. So I got I got my other jobs I think based based on my qualifications more rather more on my qualifications and credentials. The speaking though was always there. I, I can only assume from an employer's perspective. It depends on what you're trying to do though, uh, but I can only assume that that would have made me stand out. And I did work for an agency in Berlin, and that was probably attractive to them because they were small and having somebody who was uh, outwardly facing was uh, important for a small shop. Uh, if I had worked for IBM or something, you know, some big shop, that might have been less important <laughs> comparing me to another candidate, let's say, right? But uh, in, in a smaller situation, that, that could make a difference. But it's hard for me to answer your question because uh, I've never compared me to other candidates. It's, it's probably an unfair question and a poorly yeah. framed question. Yeah. So let's think about it another way. What, yeah. I, what I heard there was that you didn't really do it for the pursuit of a, your next job. It wasn't really, it didn't sound like it was intrinsically the reason why you did it. Uh, writing books and giving speeches, these are not easy things. They take a huge investment in time. They're often, from having spoken to other authors, very torturous at, at points in the process. Uh, there certainly seem to me, at least from the outside looking in, to be a labor of love. Yeah. Why on earth would you put yourself <laughs> through it three times? I think it, 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 is, it is labor of love. I think that's the only way um, to put it. But I hate writing. If people think, oh, you wrote three books, you must love it. It's like, no, I'd rather pull all the teeth out of my head without Novocaine than, than write a book. <laughs> Yet I've done that to myself three times. I, I think there is a labor of love. I think, you know, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, starting conferences, which is all about conversations, but it's also about contributing back to the field as well, too. Uh, like I said, I was just ravenous in terms of reading and absorbing everything that I could. And what I like to do is fill in the gaps or point out myths or offer a perspective that nobody offered. And when, and when I felt I had that, um, that's when I sat down and, and actually wrote a book or a longer paper or something like that. Um, but it, I think it really was a, a combination of a labor love uh, and wanting to contribute back to, to the community. Um, you know, particularly my last two books, uh, I, I say that they're basically the sum of all my mistakes, like working with jobs to be done or mapping experiences. It was like, I, I was working with mapping and I made all the mistakes. And, I, and I, it occurred to me, it was like, well, other people could learn from my mistakes, put it in a book so people can learn from your mistakes, right? And the thinking that I had to do in my own head to straighten things out, I just, I basically just put that on paper to share with the world. And then there are royalties. So there's a little bit of money from the book. The other big thing, the, the other big component though, is less about my career and my job and my marketability in terms of getting hired. It was more about uh, another source of income through things like workshops and particularly at conferences. So, you know, I'd submit a, 
talk to a conference. If they didn't take my stage talk, I would, you know, submit a workshop or sometimes both in parallel. And then I would be earning a little bit of money through the workshops as well, too. Yeah, it's a a mutually beneficial investment. I suppose there's a generosity of sharing those learnings with the community. And there's also the the reciprocity, I I imagine, of the income that you can generate from that. I I want to talk about another labor of love of yours. And that's at Rutgers. You didn't only study information science. You graduated with a BA in communications and music. And you also went on to do a Master of Arts in Music Theory and Composition, which is a fairly involved degree as far as music goes. And outside of work, as I mentioned in your introduction, you are an active jazz musician. A famous uh, jazz musician, Art Blakey, once said that jazz washes away the dust of everyday life. Hmm. What is jazz to you? Hmm. Uh, Yeah, that's a great question. You know, here at Mural, we talk a lot about collaboration and relationships and relational intelligence and things like that. And for me, jazz is a, it's, it's another perspective on how humans can interact. Obviously, it's in the context of music, which is a, a, a shared human experience through sound and time. But within that platform, for me, jazz is really about, is about a new or a different, an alternative, let's put it that way, an alternative way that human beings can interact. And I'm just totally fascinated by that. Uh, from a musical standpoint, like you said, I have a master's in music theory, so I can understand fairly complex um, uh, concepts within within music itself. But then there's also this big social component. And that's one thing I love about jazz is it's very, very social. Uh, something like a jam session, but even a jazz concert, I find to be more social than a classical concert, let's say, uh, in terms of the involvement of the audience as well. Too. And really kind of thinking about that whole, how do we experience music? It's not just it's not just the performer and the artist and the work of art. There's also the listener and there's also the, the venue and the people that are around that too. And there's this, there's this whole um, human platform that has to come together to have both music performance and music listening. Uh, and I'm really interested in that. And I think, I think the jazz experience, I think, is very, very unique. And I think it gives us life lessons. So I love the Art Blakey coach quote that you just mentioned there as well too because then the thought is well you know if if command and control organizations are no longer the you know the style of management moving forward we've heard that many many times what else do you do and it's like well there are other things that can be inspirational to us there's other models of how we can interact and still make progress and still have a common goal and still drive towards the same outcomes there are other models and jazz offers another model one that's based on improvisation which we don't think about a lot but well people in improv do um you know to some degree brendan this this conversation is improvised as well too so we we kind of do this uh all the time this idea of of take here's how i describe jazz taking something making it your own and giving it back right that's what jazz improvisation is right somebody somebody you have a melody or somebody plays a line you then take that and you make it your own and you give it back and it's through it's through the interlocking of that taking making your own giving back if everybody's doing that you can have this amazing conversation and go places every time and that and that's the that's the interesting thing about jazz unlike rock rock music or classical music where you try to be as true as possible to either the score or the recording and you want to repeat what you did exactly the same the next night jazz musicians try to do it different every time every time they play a tune they want it to be as different as different as as possible that's what they're striving for and that i find that exciting Mm -hmm. And you've suggested that there are three things that we can borrow from jazz, which will help us to collaborate more effectively. So if we're thinking about uh, outside of the top down command and control style of interacting, that jazz is an antidote, perhaps, or an answer to that. And one of those things is the way I'm framing it anyway, is a highly practical form of empathy. What do jazz musicians mean when they talk about having big ears? Yeah. So big ears is a term, particularly when you're studying and learning jazz, you can, you can get wrapped up in your own instrument very, very easily and very, very quickly. Oh, my fingering's right. Is this the, you know, is that the cool line that I rehearsed? And you're, you're kind of inside of your own little bubble thinking about your own 
music and then and then the teacher or the instructor is you know the or the expert that's in the room will say big ears which means you're not listening to other people and really big ears is listening to others more than you're listening yourself which means on the one hand you have to have a complete command of what you're trying to say and what you're trying to do that that has to be so fluid you kind of forget about what you're doing and you're really responding to what the other people are doing so what what you're doing isn't my statement and it's you know conceived of in my head and I'm expressing that it's what I'm saying my statement is a reaction to what I'm hearing right because I'm constantly listening and it's also listening to all, everything at once right so you know very often you'll be like hey let's listen to the the drummer or let's listen to the piano player like when you when you're up on stage performing jazz you're trying to hear all of that at the same time because it's the interaction of those things that is actually the interesting part it's not the keyboard or the drums or the bass. It's the, how those three things are interacting. So the big the question is when you talk about big ears is how do you listen to all of that as one sound, right? Coming and then be able to react to it. It strikes me as an ability to be hyper present and to almost be practicing an active form of meditation in some respects. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, you talk to jazz guys and they're like, they're, they, they talk about being on autopilot or in the flow and it would be, you know, it'd be akin to probably, you know, skydiving or whitewater rafting or something where the only, you're just, you're just in that moment. And that's the other thing I love about jazz. It is hyper real time. Even listening, in my my opinion, even listening to jazz is hyper real time. But when you're playing, when you're playing jazz, it it's this. It happens. It's a moment, and then it passes, and it's gone forever. And that moment, it's unless you record it. But even if you record it, that moment as it was experienced is gone. Right. So it, it's really about being in the moment. So there is almost a zen like quality to it about being here now. Right. Be here now in the moment and listen to everything going on. The advantage I think that music has and jazz has is that uh, the transparency, right? If, if, if we were collaborating in a team, Brendan, let's say there's five UX people collaborating, I would have to stop at what I'm doing and go over and look at their wireframes or their sketches and talk to them about that or go over and talk to the user researcher about that. And I can get a lot of transparency by doing that. But in jazz, you can hear, imagine hearing everybody's work or being able to see everybody's work at the same time, right? That's the level of transparency that you have. And that's really what Big Ears is all about as well, too. So that's that's a pretty cool situation. Uh, it might, might be unique to jazz, but it brings up the question, how can we do that in our work lives? How can we do that in our everyday interactions? Be hyper aware in real time and listening more than, than we're listening to others more than we're listening to ourselves. Have you found any way to turn that on when you need to turn that on <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a switch i think it's a i think it's a sensibility I, or mm. I, I mean that would be that would be like my hope you know particularly as an author and somebody who instructs in things like that would be to exam that's what i'm doing right now by the way i'm trying to examine that and being able to give it as a switch to folks so that they could a understand it but then b turn it on i think for me though it's just the sensibility that i have um, and if you ever work with me I think you'll find that I embody a lot of those, uh, a lot of those uh, characteristics of just being very willing to contribute and respectful of the other information that's coming back at me in, with a big ears kind of way, right? I, I think I think that just affects the way the way that I that I collaborate with teams or even in my personal life as well too. Mm, it's almost like a form of. Uh, self-modulation or something that's happening behind the scenes as you're engaging with people. Now, in your 2014 TEDx talk, you actually, which was about jazz and what we could learn from jazz and the way in which we communicate in our organisations, you assembled a group of jazz musicians, some of which, or maybe all of which, who had never met before yeah. and had never played together. Right. And you also, you started that talk with a reference back to uh, a very famous jazz album called Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. And it Miles did a similar thing with his band where they recorded that album, which you talked about, on the day, every song except for one 
was the first full take of that so- song. It was pressed onto the record and that is what made it out into Correct, people's yeah. ears. There's a huge degree in both of those situations, you know, you on stage at TEDx and what Miles was doing, there's a huge comfort that you need to have with uncertainty in order to yeah. be able to pull that off. Yeah. What is the shared mindset or the unspoken yeah. agreement that enables jazz musicians to do this successfully? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Before I answer that, though, th- that wasn't the only album that Miles did that on. There were other albums where he wanted the first take. Uh, didn't go back over that. Didn't give the musicians the music until they came in the studio and that kind of thing. So he actually planned that spontaneity. And I also know, I also just heard an interview with Ron Carter, a very famous jazz bassist. And he was like, I don't like rehearsals. He doesn't like to go to the rehearsals because he wants he wants everything to happen live on stage, right? He doesn't want to spoil that spontaneous moment. So it's 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 it, that's very that's very common for 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 that to happen. And the fact that I was able to do that, I'm because I'm not really a professional musician, that I was able to do that with musicians that never rehearsed together or even met together. That that's what any jazz musician around the world, regardless of where you can be in Kuala Lumpur and get some jazz musicians, and as long as they know the rules of engagement and the underlying structure. So that's the answer to your question as well, too, that to the uninitiated or the unknowing, um, you know, there's this kind of assumption or myth out there that jazz musicians are just making up what they play on the spot. That's that, the, you know, the further couldn't be from the truth, which is there's actually a layer, there's a platform of agreed knowledge around the, the, the rhythm, the beat, there's a steady pulse. There's a melody that everybody orients themselves to. There are fixed harmonies. They call them changes that everybody's orienting or orienting themselves to. And that's all contained in a form, a, a fixed set of durations. And then there's also rules of engagements between the instruments that you kind of learn. And that's what you learn as a jazz musician. That's the sensibility that I was talking about that I think I bring into my work life. But that's what jazz musicians learn when they go out and play. And it's really through a mastery, a mastery of your own instrument, a mastery of the notes and the music but also a mastery of these rules of engagement is how am I expected to behave with this piece of music and this group that I'm in front of me? What's the expectation from them of me? And you learn that intuitively so that you can walk on stage with any group of musicians and play a piece of music like we did in that talk. So it's, I I think on the, and so what that brings up for me is this, there's this interesting duality in jazz of structure yet complete flip it's very flexible on the other the surface of it is very flexible but underneath is this very very rigid structure as well too and you know this this idea of of mastery as i mentioned but jazz also embraces imperfection right because if you make a mistake you just keep going and you make the mistake part of what you you know make it sound right and that kind of thing as well too so there's all these seemingly paradoxes Right? How can it be structured and completely flexible at the same time that jazz has harmonized? Uh, and, that, and that's what I think, that's, that's the lesson I think we can get from jazz, right? Is uh, th- this idea of being two things at once, being super structured and super flexible. And I think that's the challenge of like management, you know, in the, in the future. And there's challenges of being an employee or running a company is how, how, how can I be multiple things at once, right? And it's possible. And I think that's the lesson from jazz. Is it fair or unfair to suggest that at the root of some of the problems that we experience in our communication with others in the workplace is the relative opaque nature of what those rules or patterns or structures should be or are that enable us to actually play with each other in a way that keeps us on the same page, but with enough creativity that we're able to be who we each need to be in that moment. Uh, yeah, ab- absolutely. And and I think the lesson from jazz is don't improvise the structure and the surface level uh, conversation at the same time that could, because they don't. Well, free jazz does. I should, I, should, I should qualify that. In free jazz, they actually improvise everything. Everything is completely improvised. And it's really hard to listen to free jazz. I don't know if you've ever listened to free jazz before, but you probably won't like it if you do because everything's <laughs> improvised. But, you know, you go out and listen to Miles Davis or Wynn Marsalis or some, somebody like that, and you're going to hear a lot of structure. And it's actually that structure and the tension of the structure underneath and the surface level improvisation that makes it interesting. 
uh, for, for, for most folks. And I think that's what, that's what you actually, I mean, if I think back to 2003, when I got the Razorfish, we were improvising everything. It was free jazz because we were improvising the rules of engagement and the surface level at the same time. Uh, and I think that's what agile is, right? So what agile brought to uh, development and engineering was a, a, rules, a set of rules, the rules of engagement. So you don't have to improvise how you're going to be working together. What you improvise is what, what are you going to fill those things with? What's a sprint? What's a retrospective, right? The other, uh, on, on the more of the design side of things, I think that's why design sprints are so popular because design sprints give us those rules of engagement. Five days, we're going to go from this point to that point. It's going to be filled with these activities and you know exactly. And you don't have to argue that. You don't have to argue what's going to be on day one and day five, right? Because that's all kind of taken care of. So you can focus then on the surface with that underlying, the structure. It's interesting because it's the structure that gives rise to the flexibility <laughs> and the freedom. Structure gives rise to freedom. Without, without, without structure, it's just freedom with nothing tethering it to the ground, right? So you want the structure and the freedom. That's what a design sprint does. It gives us that container within which we can work. And your the structure, so the, the structure seems to remove some of the taxation of completely freestyling something, you know, it's, it's, it removes the uh, added cognitive load of having to think through what we're doing as we're doing it. And I think, I think you're hundred percent right. That that's one of the reasons why some of these popular workshop methods have uh, been so popular is because we don't have to do that anymore. It, you're also clearly given the book that you've written a big fan of mapping experiences and that's just come out in its second edition, I think, last year, which is... Right. Um, yep. which, uh, yeah, 2020, 20, end of 2020, it came out, yeah. This book, in effect, to me, says that words alone are not enough to achieve alignment between people on what a great experience should be. Why or how do words fail us and why do we need maps to fill in those blanks? I think, I think a map is a structure. It's a, it's a type of structure. It's a visual structure. You know, in, in music, there are sonic structures. There's a rhythm and a pulse and a form and those types of sonic structures that undergird the, the freedom of jazz improvisation. And similarly, I think a map is a way to structure a common snapshot of experience, the word experience, like, you know, customer experience, user experience, we want to be more experience centric. Well, what the heck is an experience, a human experience? That's a big fuzzy thing, Brendan. How do we get our arms around it? Let's create a structure of it. Let's, let's, let's put some structure around it so that we're not arguing about what is the experience? When does it begin? Whose is it? What are the things? You have the, the conversation is, okay, so what does this mean to us? And I think what, um, what a map does is similar to what you were talking about is that there's a cognitive offloading of uh, instead of fighting about what is an experience and when does it begin and end and all those things, you're, okay, you're, 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 you're at the next level of creativity. Like where are our, our, our opportunities? Where are the gaps that we need to address and things like that as well too. So it does provide that, uh, that same structure so that you can have freedom type of effect, I believe. And you've outli outlined four stages in a process of mapping experience, and I'll just recap these briefly. The first is to start, to initiate, to actually make the map relevant, so set some context. The second is to investigate, to research, to make that real for people. The third is to illustrate, to design it, to make it visual so that people can see and understand it. And the fourth and final is to align, to get people on the same page so that we can actually do something with the exercise that we've just been through. Now, that all sounds very easy when I describe it that way. It makes a lot of sense. What stage, though, do people typically struggle with the most? I think, um, I think it's that last one. And the, the end of that last one, by the way, is, is make it actionable as well, too, is how do you keep the momentum going? Because a, ma a mapping effort is only a point in time. Right. And it's what happens before that, but more importantly, what happens after that? How do you make it actionable? The kind of the big the big point in all of that. So first of all, before before I make that point, I just wanna I just wanna mention that in the book, I embrace lots of different types of mapping, customer journey map, service blueprint, mental model diagrams, experience map. There's a whole bunch that I actually bring together. And that that was the point of the book was to bring all of that together, but then also point to some differences between those. Um, at the same time, though, I wanted to give folks a general process. How do I approach this? 
And the four phases that you just mentioned, I believe, are generic enough that you could take any mapping effort and they would apply to it, right? So I wanted to kind of cover a range of different mapping types without being prescript prescriptive. So so that so that's why I did that. But the the point that I wanted to make is it's it's the important thing is the mapping. It's the verb. It's not the map. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see is folks putting way too much attention in the artifact and the diagram and the deliverable itself, right? There are no magical answers that pop off of the map. You don't make a customer journey map or a service blueprint and then your answers just pop off and go hit you over the head like a frying pan and go, oh, now we know exactly what to do. There's a layer of conversation that has to happen on top of that, right? And that's that align phase that I'm talking about is you have to analyze and evaluate and find your opportunities and align around those. But I think more importantly is then how do you, how do you make that actionable? as well too. So the align, it's not just align, it's align and make actionable, I would say, as well too, or that's included in there. That's what I mean when I say align, right? Is how do we keep that momentum going? And I think you can keep the momentum going better is if you approach mapping as an activity, as a verb, rather than a map is a deliverable I have to make. Big ears are coming to mind here. (laughs) And also something else that you've said, which is I've heard you describe maps as invitations for others to engage in conversation and that really what we're trying to design here is a lean forward experience. So the role of the designer is less of a map maker and becomes more of a facilitator of action the further we get into the process of creating the map. It sounds like from what you've described there, previously that you see maps as more of a uh, a means to an end as opposed to an end in and of themselves. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a springboard into conversations. It's a springboard into uh, further conclusions and decisions that you need to align around, right? And a lot of design work is, a, is about that. A lot of design work is trying to get others around you, even other designers, to kind of agree on the direction and the solution. And one thing that designers do is they create models of the world, right? A persona is not a person, it's a model of a persona. Why do you do that? So that you have a common picture in your mind, you can get aligned around it and have a conversation. A map of an experience is not an experience, it's a model of an experience so that you can have a conversation around it, right? So for me, that, that was a big you know realization that I had. Not only is it an activity, but what that also means is that I think as designers, or at least the better designers that, that I've worked with, are also good facilitators. Not, not in terms of you know, running a design sprint, but just being able to uh, steer a conversation or get you know, the conversation going in, in, a, in, in, in a direction. I don't want to say in the right direction, but in, get, in, in a direction that, that is the appropriate direction, right? getting that conversation to move forward. Uh, I think that's also part of it being a designer, to be honest with you. Mm. It's making me recall a conversation I had with Uday Gajenda about his uh, framing of designer's role and two of the three of them I can recall that are relevant here. One is that role of stagecraft that we play in terms of the way we facilitate, but also when you start to get into leadership uh, territory, the role of statecraft in the designer's toolkit and how we can actually have those conversations across the business. How in in your observations and perhaps in your own practice as a leader and a designer, how much of facilitating that almost higher level conversation about what we're going to do with the outcomes of this mapping exercise is free jazz versus (laughs) something that's perhaps a bit more structured and that there's actually thought that goes into the choreography of what that conversation looks like? Yeah, I think it could, I think it could be a lot more structured. Let's just put it that way. And when I think about mapping experiences, you know, the book that you were just talking about and all of that uh, process that you just mentioned, as even and jobs to be done. I mean, for me, how I approach jobs to be done was another structured language, particularly at the top. What is the human problem that we're trying to solve and how do we understand, understand that structure and understanding around that and then B, structure alignment around that as well, too. That's what I think jobs to be done brings to the table. But you know what? Uh, design thinking and design thinking methods also try to structure that. You know, you look at the D school, they have their five uh, honeycombs, uh, 
what is it? And em empathize, ideate, prototype, test. I, I left one out of there. Re there might be a research in there or something like that. And then there are methods within there as well, too. So you come up with a point of view and you form a how might we statement, right? You know, so there are things like that that you can grab onto that are structural. Um, however, in practice, I, I think I've observed, I've experienced myself uh, and I've seen others rather improvise a lot of that as well. Uh, and rather than relying on those existing structures or, or they're, in, they're, they're making up the structure kind of as they go. I think that's part of where we are in our maturity uh, as, a, as a field, right? That I think as, you know, in another two decades, let's say from now, I think uh, a lot of the kind of growing pains and the thrashing and the different methods and approaches that have been thrown into the mix. I think a lot of that will be, uh, I don't want to say standardized, but there'll be, there'll be paths forward that you can follow and not worry so much about the, you know, what's under the hood, as we say in America, but rather what's, what's on the surface and the creativity could come out even more so. It seems to me that the wheels start to fall off when some scrutiny starts to be applied to some of the methods and outcomes from the methods mm. that we use. We're not in design and I'm speaking broadly here, so this won't be representative of everybody, but we, we seem to be very uncomfortable when challenged about the findings or the uh, recommendations that we have that fall out of the uh, processes and methods that we use. And this seems to me to be a huge disservice to design and I really mm. wish that we could become more mm. confident and comfortable in addressing mm. those challenges. When you've experienced challenge to mm. particular recommendations that you've made, you know, you're on the executive leadership team of a fairly significant tech company here. How do you handle it? Like, yeah. Where do you go to? What's your uh, approach to, <laughs> to taking on that challenge and working with it? Um, I think, well, well, first of all, I just want to say that uh, a lot of folks go into, into UX because they're passionate about it, right? And they want to help users and things like that. And that's a good thing. And I think you should embrace that. But then it does, it does come out in some of the ways that you mentioned, right? This, this, you know, pe people attached to their babies and things like that. And, you know, not, not being able to uh, bring the most rational argument to the table, which isn't necessarily always needed because sometimes a passionate argument is good as well too. But I think just being being able to think through and talk through some of those things. So I, I would, um, and I hate to say data because I'm, I actually think we overuse data in business context too much, but evidence. Evidence, I think, is is what's needed. That if you can bring in logic that's that is in, informed by evidence that that's always going to be rather than your own opinion right i think your own opinion matters though and i think you have to be able to argue from an opinion standpoint but you also have to think about evidence and the logic around that evidence as well too is, is important and that's one of the differences i think between a junior and a senior designer because i see like i mentioned before you can go out and study you know basically ux design and when i was working at citrix the last company that i worked for we would get these resumes in you know people from carnegie mellon and, and things like that and i was like holy crap it took me 10 years to get all the skills that you have on your little checklist there right and i was like oh my god they're they're better than me right but then they would come in and they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to survive in the you know when, when the going gets tough and they're challenged and things like that it's like oh that's you you need some scars first right uh so so kind of getting those scars but then being able to it's not just confidence it's it, i think there is an articulation of your opinion and maneuvering and working with the evidence and, and the logic that's around that evidence whether it's quantitative or qualitative because i'm a i'm a big fan of leveraging qualitative evidence uh in in healthy conversations so it, it might be that as well too but being able to do that uh, but the other thing the other thing too the other whole side of it is knowing which battles to pick that's something else I saw, you know, with uh, younger students coming right out of school into their first jobs. Everything was a battle, right? You know, oh, no, that button has to be that color with that drop shadow on it. And he's like, no, that's not your battle. You got, big, you got bigger battles to, to fry, you know, bigger fish to fry than that one as well, too. So also knowing 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 when to back off is, is, is also a sensibility that I think comes with experience. How much being an, an executive leader, how much of your sensibilities that you've developed to 
occupy that role. How much of that has been based on, and this is a very leading question, but how much, if at all, has it been based on understanding the incentives and what's at stake for people that are outside of your immediate function that you're responsible for? Yeah. Uh, you mean others like cu customers or others in, in, in the company? In the company. Yeah, it actually it actually opened my eyes in in, in many ways. Um, as an angry UX designer, I used to pound my fist on the desk and say, "They don't get it, right?" <laughs> Generic "they," right? But you know, in reality, I didn't get I didn't get a lot about go to market and sales and things like that. So I, I learned a lot about that and and have a different perspective and respect for a lot of things that were outside of of kind of my purview in the past, which was pretty much product and product design. But there's lots of other things that go on in a business uh, around go-to-market motions and you know pressures that come from the top, like from investors and things like that. So I, I got I got a much wider angle of of things and 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 a, and a respect for other motions. At the same time though, I'm also able to notice that um, other fields, let's just pick on sales for a moment or you know in some degree even engineering. But they're they're also missing a user perspective as well too, because mm, if 100%. we if we you know yeah if there was a topic you know in, in front of us I'd be like yeah but no that's not how people experience software and I felt like I knew how people experience software because I did whatever a thousand usability tests or whatever and I know that people aren't going to experience the software where or the experience they're not going to have the same experience that you think they're going to have when you're sitting there in a room dreaming up some strategy. I'm like, yeah, no, that's not going to work because humans have brains. You're not taking that into account that the people that we're trying to serve have brains and emotions, you know, and, and they're, they're not rational. Your they're rational messy. strategy doesn't match. Yeah, right. Exactly. It does not mesh with the messy world out there. So I think I was able to embrace the mess as a UX designer. And I brought that with me then when I went into, you know, some other directions, particularly here at Nero. Uh, and sometimes that opinion would come out and, and people would look at me like I was crazy. And I was like, no, you need to hear more of this, not less of it. Well, let, let's keep the, the, the heater or the heat on design here. Yeah. There's something that you've previously said about design's role in innovation was really uh, made my ears prick up, made me pay attention. And you were quite critical here for good reason, I feel. You said ideas are, are overrated. If your goal is to generate more and more ideas, you're probably not going to get that far. There's no value in a sticky note. A sticky note with an idea doesn't have any business value. You've got to put some teeth on that. In design, why do we seem to confuse ideas with innovation? I don't know. I don't know, but that was the revelation that I had that led me to. to did I write that? I wrote. You were reading from something. You said that. I wrote. You said, I said that, that. And I something said you spoke. That. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And anyway, why I spoke it? Okay. Because I've written. I have an article out there called "Ideas Are Overrated," and I don't, I don't know if you were reading that, but sim similar thought there as well too. This was a revelation I had because I was guilty of it. I was addicted to ideas, and I would go into a room and say, "Here's a problem. Here's a how my we statement. Let's fill the wall with sticky notes and." the measure of success was how many sticky notes we used that day, right? And oh, the more, the better, right? And, and there was this kind of, what I realized is that there was this kind of, kind of implicit Darwinism of ideas that the, the, be the best will survive, right? That if we just get more ideas, the best will survive. But then what I realized is all these other forces going on in companies, like I said, I got exposed to sales motions, go-to-market motions, and investors, and all kinds of other concerns that a business has. And what I realized is there's actually antibodies in an organization working against the good ideas. Sometimes the best ideas will be squashed by the antibodies inherent in any organization. So the question isn't, how do we get more ideas? Because to be honest with you, Brendan, I've never worked for a company that didn't have enough ideas. It was never the volume of ideas, right? In fact, I ask that question a lot of times when I do workshops. Does anybody work for an organization that doesn't have enough ideas? And almost nobody raises their hand. And they always laugh. It's like, no, we have tons of ideas, right? The, the, the bigger question is, which ideas move forward? And the question under that is, how do they move forward, right? Because the logic that you think is going to move an idea forward, it's a great idea, Right. Mm. Right, we, we we said it was a great idea. We had a workshop in the design sprint, right? Yeah. Of course, it's on the sticky note. Everybody thought this was a great idea. That's not the logic that others in your organization are going to use to invest in that idea and actually make it move forward. 
So, and this is where the, the facilitator comes back in, is that not only do you have to have conversations about your designs and your craft and conversations about ideation and innovation, but you also have to have conversations that are going to uh, resonate with other folks, namely people who are going to invest in a business idea or give resources to it or decide to, to build it in the next product feature, uh, release and things like that as well, too. That it's, it's being able to navigate that world, which is actually more important than generating more and more and more and more ideas. And I know that because I was guilty of it. As I said, I was addicted to generating ideas. And I thought I was doing a company of service by generating more ideas. And I realized I wasn't. And these days, I don't know about you, Brendan, but when I do design sprints or ideation sessions, it's hard to come up with anything original these days with like so many startups in Silicon Valley. Sometimes you come up with an idea and you're like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a web service that's out there. Yeah, there's a startup that has already done that. You know, It's like, oh, there's not actually not a lot that people haven't already kind of thought and it's so easy to launch a service these days. It's probably been launched too in some form as well too. So it, it starts to become it starts to become less and less valuable the more and more ideas that you generate. That's what I find at least. So if we can't rely on the idea to stand on its own, you know, to be yeah. self evident and to be this amazing thing that all your executives and your organizations just fawn over and and want to go and throw their careers behind and risk it all, what is it? What is an idea with the appropriate degree? of teeth look yeah. like? like what is the shepherding or the support or the cotton wool or the how do we break down the brick wall whatever you want what, whatever yeah. analogy you want to roll with here what does that look like how do we do that better yeah i think this is where lean and lean thinking uh come in uh around build measure learn and there's this idea of an mvp out there minimum viable product i i called it um what did i call it the minimum business Viability. I changed it because it's not I, the problem with MVP is it focuses on the product itself, and then people have bastardized that term to mean a, a cheap version of your product, which it's not. It's actually it's actually supposed to prove out the value of your idea. So I, I came up with a new term. I'm just, it's slipping my mind right now. What I call the minimum minimum business uh, decision or something like that. Uh, to be thinking in those terms. To be thinking in terms of. What would it take for the organization to see not only that this is a great idea that came from a sticky note, but it actually can be represented as a prototype or it has technical viability and we've put it in front of customers and they're foaming at the mouth and it's going to get you eyeballs or dollars or whatever, uh, whatever it's going to get. Like literally going a lot further than at least I used to go. Uh, and I know folks that practice lean are like, Jim, you're just, you're talking about lean here now. And to some degree I am, but very often, you know, going from, going from research all the way to proving out a business idea is, is a larger aperture than a lot of the UX that I practiced, you know, back in the day. And, and then, and then even beyond, you know, championing that idea and even volunteering to like build it out, which I did in, in my last company as well, too. I was like, no, we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll build out this service thinking in a more service mindset as well, too. So going as going further, uh, I think, particularly in the other direction, that is not generating the idea, but taking the idea further. That's my big recommendation. Is that something that is, and not necessarily in a negative sense here, but is that something that practice of taking it further, of building it out, of trying to understand usefulness or value, you know, something that can give the business confidence that this thing's worth while making a larger bet on. Is that an inherently wasteful exercise? No, I don't think so. It's not wasteful. It's transformative is, is how I would put it, right? Because, you know, something expressed on a sticky note is is not the thing. It's not even the prototype of the thing. Because I found if you take a sticky note and then make a prototype out of it, you're like, oh, that sticky note had not nearly enough detail. And the thing that we actually prototype is very, very, even just a sketch. You don't even have to go to prototype. Just like take that thing and 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 make a make a wireframe of it. Like it changes. And you take that and you make a prototype, it changes. And then you take that and you put it in front of somebody else and it changes as well too. So I, I guess there's exhaustive each one of those points that you might call waste. I, I think waste is, is the wrong word, though. Mm. Um, it's almost like you to... need to define the minimum. You were talking about the minimum business yeah. viability or whatever before. It's like being really clear on what that bar is. 
Well, you want to you want to do that so you're so you're not just wandering up up and down and just you know shoot shooting a dark uh, a mm-hmm. dark in the dark. So you you want you want to have some constraints and confidence. But as the uh, as you go from idea to to service, uh, ultimately, hopefully. Um, there will be transformations that take place and the, the exhaust, I wouldn't call the exhaust waste. I would call it, um, I mean, learning is the first thing that comes to my mind, but I think it's more about, it's more about transformation, right? It's just the fact that you, neither you nor anybody else in the world knows what that thing actually is based on the sticky note. Yeah. We think that's the case. It's like, here's a sticky note. It's an innocent little sticky note. I'm going to bring this in the CEO and go here invest in this. No, that's not how it works. There, there needs to be a transformation to go from sticky note to investing in, and then even launching it after that. So I think it's, 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 it's focus on the transformation and also realize that it's going to transform. There is no way that your initial concept is going to end up that way on the street. And there's this transformation and the willingness to go through that transformation process. I wouldn't call it waste. I, I don't say, I don't think it's waste. I think that's just how it is. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now we've been pretty critical of design or UX here falling short on a, on, a, on a couple of measures of what it might take to actually be more effective in the organization. But you've also previously asserted that UX is really useful in reducing the risk that an innovation won't be adopted and can actually also on top of that be useful in accelerating the rate of that innovation's adoption or that feature or that product, whatever level of aperture we're looking at here. And you suggested in the pr- past that ethnography, prototyping, scenarios, personas, these types of methods can be useful in us achieving that. Now that was back in 2012, right? That was a that yeah, was a previous yeah. that was a previous gym. That's going back yeah. a decade now. <laughs> yeah. Do you still feel that those methods are the best for predicting and accelerating adoption? Um, I don't know if they're the best, but they that's what they ultimately try to do in my book. And I'm I'm a little bit biased. I'm gonna even go back 15 years before that talk to um, uh, my, my time at Rutgers University uh, in information school. And uh, this was actually my introduction into kind of human-centered thinking. Let's just put it that way, was Everett Rogers. Everett Rogers is probably the most famous author that nobody knows about. That's what I like. That's why I like to describe Everett Rogers. He wrote a book, a very famous book called The Diffusions of Innovations that I, that I read, at least the initial chapters of it. And that was the moment uh, in school in 1996 or whatever it was. Uh, and it kind of opened my eyes to a lot of the assumptions that we have about what, how humans work. Actually, there's counterintuitiveness there, right? Uh, and he was talking about why things didn't get adopted, why innovations didn't get adopted. And we all know Everett Rogers from the adoption curve. So the innovators, the laggards, the, the, well, the innovators, the early majority, the middle majority, late majority, and the laggards, right? He's the guy that came up with that theory of how innovations get adopted. And we all know his innovation adoption curves, right? And I had, that had always been a part of me because that was literally my introduction into human-centered thinking was Everett Rogers and the diffusions of innovations. So when I, you know, then I had some uh, practical experience with UX and writing and talking about it under my belt, I kind of returned to that thinking and I tried to put the two together and I said, so what is the, why are we doing all of this? And I think ultimately what we're striving for is the thing that we make, product, service, or otherwise, we want people to adopt it, right? Which is different than sales, right? And it's different than demand generation, right? We're not trying to drum up hype or excitement around our new product with a campaign and a price point and a deal. It's we want that thing that we're making to ultimately benefit human beings so that they naturally go, I want this. Thing. Thanks for making that for me, Brendan. How did you know I wanted that? And the answer is because you did ethnography and the design thing and you did all those things, right? Uh, what's the single best, best method? I don't think there's a single best method out there. And that's why I, I kind of embrace all of them. And even though I wrote a book on jobs to be done, I think that's a pretty good way, particularly way up front. And I described, by the way, I just, I described jobs to be done as a way to predict adoption is why will people adopt your product? Get their job done. <laughs> and fulfill their needs. If you can address their unmet needs, you increase your chances of adoption later on, right? Um, So I see jobs to be done as one way to do it, but I'm still a fan of ethnography. I'm still a fan of design sprints. I'm still a fan of lean UX and all of those things because I think we need a a, a robust tool set to be able to navigate our 
modern organizations and complex business spaces that we're in as well, too. And Jobs to be Done is another tool. I think it does it pretty well, actually, predicts adoption, maybe better than others, but you need those other things as well, too. Um, so in, in any event, yeah, it's going back to my exposure, my early exposure to Everett Rogers, the fusion of innovations, and really looking at why do human beings adopt in one innovation over another innovation? And I just really felt that that's what we're all about. That's what we're all trying to do. Yeah, usability and conversion rates, that's all kind of surface level stuff. It's ultimately, we, we, want, we want the innovations that we make to have an impact. And they're not going to have an impact unless the population that you're making that for accepts it. And says, yep, that's what I, thank you. Thank you for making that for me, right? And that's adoption. Back in the early 2010s, you did some work for GoToMeeting. And you were there at the time that the company launched a feature, which I believe was called <laughs> HD Faces. How is HD Faces a, a really good example? So riffing off what you've just been talking about there, yeah. of how not to make yeah. a smart bet on what customers will find useful, will value, will pay for, will adopt. Yeah, I mean, for me, that, that was an example of, of disruption. Uh, and when I say disruption, I mean the Clayton Christensen definition of disruption, which is very specific. It's not just a general use of the word disruption. He talks about market disruption where an incumbent in, in, a, in any field or domain, they start to get more and more technologically advanced, more and more feature rich, offering more and more service to their customers, to their increasingly sophisticated customers as well too. And the, the way that I kind of describe it is they, they kind of work themselves up into a tizzy where their technology is what they think they're selling, right? That, and so more of my technology, the better, like HD Faces was that company saying to itself, well, if this is hard for our engineers to do, it must provide a lot of value, right? Because it's hard for, it's going to be really expensive and hard for us to do this. So customers must really, really want this thing, right? That's you working yourself upstream in the market uh, to a higher and higher technical position. Disruption happens when somebody says, yeah, but I think people just need webcams and I can do that through my browser now. <laughs> like, I mean, at the time, web, you know, Screen sharing and webcams was was a fairly complex and unique technology, but now everybody shares screens and webcams and stuff like that. And and the the the, the newcomer into the market figures out a way to fulfill that need way cheaper. Um, and then it's a symptom of companies that they get wrapped up in their own technology. And it was a lot of money to implement HD faces. And it, what it did was it took your webcams on a go to meeting call and made them high definition because. That's the most important thing in a, in a conference call? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It, it did nothing for our sales and it did nothing for our brand reputation. And there was almost no lift from this thing that we invested a ton of money into. It's a total symptom of, the, of market disruption. So if you could have given the executives at GoToMeeting your latest book, The Jobs To Be Done Playbook, mm, yeah. before they came up with mm. HD Faces, yeah, yeah. what might they have learned that could have yeah. helped them to avoid the failure of that particular product? The things that people value may not be the hardest thing for you to do or the most expensive things for you to do. And there were tons of things inside of GoToMeeting, obviously pre-pandemic, like a decade before the pandemic, actually. And at the time, uh, you know, we were struggling with the fact that a lot of people didn't realize they could talk through their computer. Sounds weird. But in 2010, it wasn't assumed that you can just talk into your laptop. So people would call up, call in, right? You remember when you got on a conference call and then you dialed in on the phone, right? Or that was the whole conference call. That, that could have been the whole conference call, but we were pairing it with screen sharing. But you had these people dialing in on their phone, right? So this idea of muting, you know, the, the mute etiquette that we have now was not only did people not know how to mute, they didn't know how to talk through their computer, right? And I think there were some, we, we, if we solve that problem, I bet if you, I, I didn't do a Jobs to Be Done study, but I bet people would have said, you know, one of the, one of the biggest unmet needs was, you know, mi minimize the struggles that I have using audio, you know, or something like that would have been something around audio. And what did we do? We brought out, you know, high definition webcams, right? And from a design team, I, I know my the design team was very, very focused on trying to solve that audio problem, but. I didn't get the sense the rest of the organization was really, really trying to solve those more human problems. Like, how do two people interact on this screen thing, right? And I think what would have come out was a whole different set of priorities 
And what they thought was going to save the company, I think user, you know, our customer base would have told them different things. And a lot of those things were probably easy wins or low cost, low effort things as well too. But our, our focus was off, I believe. Uh, and that's what Jobs to be Done brings with it. It brings a human-centered focus back to the table. And it does it in a very clear and rigorous way too, because you can lay it on the table and say, here are the top five things that people are, are struggling with in general, but there are unmet needs that you can try to serve, right? Um, so, and, and that's important. That's the evidence that I was talking about, right? Trying to, trying to bring that evidence to the table. Now, I was having a deep dive into jobs to be done and prep for today, and I came across a couple of your talks where, where you were going through it to different levels of uh, detail. And one of the things that stood out to me was that the research methods and jobs to be done seem to be very much in the wheelhouse of the research methods that UXs would be comfortable with. You know, you suggested in one of the talks I saw anyway that there are really two main areas of research that happen in a jobs to be done project initially starting with what seemed to me to be very similar to the kinds of interviews we would do with customers or with our users. Just how close are those interviews that you do in a jobs to be done study to what most UXs, again, this is a a gross generalization, would be comfortable with having previously done interviews with customers or users? Like how closely aligned are There would be a familiarity and a comfort there if you've ever led that kind of open interview. And they are semi-structured interviews um, that that essentially you're doing. And it's it's a lot of listening and then guiding the conversation. I think the big difference is what you're look what you're listening for and what you're looking for from from that interview is is going to be slightly different than maybe if you do a broader ethno- ethnographic study or even something like contextual inquiry. And that's what Jobs to be Done brings with it. It brings with it a very, very specific and predefined language of categories of information that you're listening for. Right, the steps, the emotional factors, and the way that those things are formulated is also very, very specific as well, too. Um, but if you're comfortable leading a semi-structured, open-ended kind of interview uh, in a professional setting through contextual inquiry, let's say, you would probably be very comfortable also doing a jobs to be done interview. It's just your 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 attention is just going to be focused on 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 perhaps different and specific other specific things. Yeah. Got it, got it. And I get the sense that one of the things that you feel is beneficial in jobs to be done is also that we get an opportunity through doing it to quantify what those jobs or opportunities are that that we should be focused on. So you talked about focus earlier, like yeah. what is the most meaningful thing we can do for our customer, for example? And I get the sense that jobs to be done helps us to answer that. Which method or it seemed to me you, you were suggesting surveys here are then used mm-hmm. once you've yeah. actually mapped out the job to then figure out what matters and what doesn't? Yeah. Yeah, you, you can then quantify things if, if, if you need to or if you want to um, through surveys. I mean, the, the thing about a survey is then your sample size goes up. Right. When you're doing qualitative interviews, uh, I don't know about you, Brendan, but I'm usually, you know, 10 to 20 people. If you do a study with 20 qualitative interviews, that's a pretty heavy lift. You got to schedule all of those, you know, an hour each. You got to three hours for the analysis or more per study. That's a lot of data that you're going to collect. That's a heavy lift if you do 20 interviews. Um, and, and I wouldn't count that as a quantitative sample. Running a survey, though, you can, you can survey 500 people. Right, if you want. So you can get quantitative really, really quick. You're obviously not going to get the depth and the texture that you get from the qualitative side, but that's why the two, I think, pair together. The importance, I think, of quantifying things is to be able to have that evidence. Uh, and it is very, very powerful for those people that are going to be listening to your evidence differently, right? Because when a UX person comes up with an insight, a qualitative insight, and shows it to another UX person, there's a whole sensibility that they bring with it to interpret that, right? If you bring that to somebody else in business or marketing or sales or something like that, they're going to say, you only talk to six people? That's, that's what they're going to be thinking, right? So it, it's really, I, I believe, the quantification of jobs to be done or the possibility to have quantification. I think it brings powerful evidence then to the table and it makes all of your qualitative research that much more valuable in a broader group of people. But there are also ways to prioritize things that are a lot more shooting from the hip, as, as we say. Uh, which you, you could you know, use the team that you're in to try to uh, estimate or, or guess or prioritize on behalf of the customer as well, too, if you can't go out and do a, a big survey, which I've done. I, I've done that as well, too. And that's just a function of time and resource 
and, and things like that. Because sometimes you don't have the you don't have the ability to to administer a large survey and analyze the the results. What could you do? You could you could still take that very precise and rigorous uh, jobs to be done insight that you've extracted in its nice categories, in its nice formulations, and you can still do a prioritization internally or with your team or somehow that's a little bit more guerrilla style, as we used to say back in the days as well, too. So, you know, I'm not saying you can't get value out of jobs to be done unless you do this quantitative survey. I'm just saying that that's a that's a very, very powerful tool. That's part of the technique that you can kind of build up to or not. And that technique, that survey, it's like the things you're listening for in a jobs to be done interview. You're you're trying to key into specific questions here. What are those? I think there's two main questions that you ask oh, right, people yeah. in a jobs to be done survey. Right. Yeah. There. This is a technique that Tony Olwick uh, pioneered uh, to, to try to pinpoint on that needs. Uh, and the first one is how important is this to you? So you would end up with statements. They can either be uh, what I call job step statements or outcome statements. Those are two different categories of information in jobs to be done. And each one of those categories has its own rules of formulation. Let's just talk about outcomes uh, for the sake of ease here. Um, you could take all of your outcome statements and then have people rank them along two dimensions. How important is this to you? And how satisfied are you getting that done today? I've been starting to phrase that second question as how easy is this for you to get done? Because I'm dissatisfied with the satisfaction question. But in, 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 in any event, you basically have two points of data for each one of those statements, which are very rigorously formulated. And you can even validate those if you want before you go out. And what that allows you to do is then plot them on a matrix. And what you can see are the things that are highly important, but people are finding difficult to get done or they're dissatisfied getting done. Those, that's, where you wanna, that's where you wanna put your attention, right? The things that are important, but are hard to get done currently. Um, so it's still you know, a subjective, it's a subjective measure of importance and difficulty, but we're able to quantify that at levels that satisfy right. other stakeholders right. need for quantification. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's amazing what then comes out because you're like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that. Or uh, then, you know, you get the results and you go back to people and it's like, yeah, that, you know, but it didn't come out in the qualitative study because sometimes in the in the qualitative part of the study, you don't necessarily get that side to side comparison of all of the, all of the things at once. And you do the quantification and yeah, it's, it's about the data and satisfying those stakeholders, but you often get something back that you didn't expect either as a researcher as well too. So it shines a new light onto, onto your understanding of the field as well. Now I'm just mindful of time. I've got one last question on jobs to be done here before we bring the show down to a close. Now this fascinates me, jobs to be done. It really does. It seems to me that it holds so much potential for increasing the influence that designers and UXs have within their organizations. But it also, on the other hand, doesn't seem to have been fully embraced by the UX and design community. Now, you've said about this, or touching on this, never before in my experience has what the what business people are talking about overlapped with what we're talking about. We should be part of this conversation and be involved in what they are talking about when they say jobs to be done. So why have, at least to me, it seems that product in particular has been much quicker to jump on to jobs to be done and to see its value and use it than we have in UX. Why is this? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It, it actually is a mystery to me because when I first learned about jobs to be done, I was deep in UX. I, you know, I hadn't even written my mapping book yet. I was, I was doing eth ethnographic studies. I was reading the contextual inquiry book at the time and things like that. And then I learned about jobs to be done. I said, well, this is great. This will help me as a UX practitioner. And, and then later on, I learned that a lot of UX practitioners are saying, uh, it's a gimmick or it's just, it's a fad or I, I think part, and I don't know where that comes from I, because it only ha it has only helped me <laughs> in my career. So I'm like, no, this will actually help you. Uh, I think it comes from, it, it appears to overlap as we talked about with the interviewing uh, technique and contextual inquiry. Some of the things that I've even mentioned too, it appears to overlap with those things. But um, I think there are two important differences. The first is it didn't come from the design community. It, it wasn't, it was, it's not a design method. That's the thing. It's actually, it actually came from the business community and it was a way for them to understand the people in their markets. 
And that's an important point that I think, again, when you're facilitating these conversations, and this is what I would do, I would explain jobs to be done, and this came from Clayton Christensen, and this is a business thing, and I'd frame the conversation differently than this is some hocus pocus UX thing that was just made up last year. You know, it, it, it brings a different weight when you frame things in those two different ways. Um, and, but the other thing is, I do think jobs to be done has a level of precision and rigor that a lot of other methods don't have. Uh, that a lot of uh, other, other methods don't have. I mean, I'm, you know, just to pick on like design thinking, for instance. So just, I'm a fan of design thinking, by the way. I love, you know, D-School, Mural, we just acquired a company that enables design thinking, training and things like that. Uh, I love design thinking. But there's a point in design thinking where you're supposed to create a how might we st- sentence based on insights in your research. Uh, and the D-School actually teaches, come up with a point of view. Right. So go out and do research, empathize, come up with a point of view, and then take that forward into your ideation. I cannot find anywhere in the design thinking literature, and I've asked probably a dozen people, what is precisely, tell me what the criteria is for deciding on that thing that you're going to move forward into the ideation. And design thinking doesn't have that logic. In fact, one of the, one of the authors that I found says, pick the thing that's the most surprising to you as a researcher. And make a how might we statement out of that. And I'm like, well, wow, that's highly biased. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. yeah. And mm-hmm. how, how do you know you're being complete and comprehensive? And how do you know, you know, so, so I it's think. It's also not very user-centered or human-centered. It, it's not. It's, it's the not. antithesis of what we it's, say it, it's that we're biased. there to do. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the researcher who's saying, I don't know, I'll just throw this, I'll throw my hat into the ring. I'll, I'll throw this thing into the ring. And so I think, I think, that, I think jobs to be done, I always saw it as something complimentary that could give design thinking a lot more power if you bring your design thinking research in, do the quantitative prioritization and say, let's make a how might we statement around this because 500 people said that this is the most important thing that's very really satisfied on, right? And, and you'll also then get better, I believe, participation from your stakeholders as well, too, because they won't be like, you know, this Brendan just made this thing up. Why are we doing this thing for Brendan? Because he did so he did six interviews and he's making this how might we statement up. Right. You, you, you get away from that. Right. So I think Jobs We Done brings a level of rigor that is missing in some of these other uh, methods and disciplines as well. So same thing with a design sprint. Like, how do you, you know, how do you know what to put in the top of a design sprint? Uh, for instance, so those things. So I, I think those two things. One, the fact that Jobs to be done is not a design discipline. It did not come from the design community. It actually came from the business community. You can leverage that fact uh, to your advantage. And then the other one is that you can bring a level of, of specificity and rigor into your into your methods, even if it's another type of method like design sprint or something. Right? You can bring that in there. Jobs to be done allows you to do that with a lot more confidence and a lot more evidence. It answers the question, how do we know if we're solving the right problem? Right, exactly. Mm. Exactly. But it doesn't and tell us the, how to solve it. It doesn't tell you at all how to solve it. In fact, Jobs to be done goes out of its way to expunge solutions from its language. Uh, it's the exact opposite. It just tells you what problem, what's the right problem. And what's the right problem is the one that's going to predict adoption. Because what Jobs to be done says, if you can come up with the right solution, we're not telling you what the solution is, but if you can come up with the right solution for this problem, your chances of innovation success, i.e. adoption, increase. That's what it says. Yeah. Hmm. Jobs to be done, people. Check it out. Hey, Jim, <laughs> helping people to focus and to collaborate more effectively has clearly been a major aspect of your life's work. And speaking of that work, you once said that work is not a place. Work mm-hmm. is what you accomplish with others. So what is the most important skill or behavior that you feel is within each of our ability to improve that if we did so, if we took that on, that we would accomplish more when working with other people? Yeah. Yeah. As I mentioned, it's a great question uh, because I, I've always described UX as a full contact sport, right? That it, and that's where the facilitation and conversation um, fostering uh, aspect comes in. Uh, un- unlike, uh, I'm just going to compare it to like coding or programming. No, nobody looks at a uh, at a programmer's code and says, "Oh, that's a, that's not aligned," or you know, you why did you use those uh, <laughs> phrases in there? But everybody with two eyeballs looks at UX work, right? So it is very much more a conversation, and you're out there, and it is about agreement and alignment and getting all of those things. That's why I call it a a, a full a full contact sport. Um, so collaboration, I think, is core to design. And being able to be a good collaborate, a good collaborator, and leading by example, and, and I actually think there's three things. So I'm going to answer your question about the one thing with three things. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the one the first is a willingness, a willingness to participate in the collaboration and a willingness to listen, to have big ears and a willingness to listen to others, right? Uh, the other is respect as well, too. And again, as I was an angry UX designer, sometimes I didn't respect what 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 I was, what I heard from others. But there the, there are other perspectives and other worlds in in inside of any organization that I think you need to respect as well too. So willingness to listen and then respect uh, that you also need to bring. And then the other one I think is curiosity. Uh, the last one is is curiosity. Uh, hey, tell me more about that. Um, or you know, yes and. Or, or what if we took your idea and we added it with this idea, right? So that just that, that curiosity of uh, not just hearing the words coming out of somebody's mouth uh, and then reacting to that, um, but uh, re- really, really trying to think about what, what that, wh- what is new about that, right? Because, you know, we talked about jazz, you take something, you make it your own, you give it back into the world. Then you have to take that, make it your own and give it back into the world. You can only do that if you're curious. So willingness, respect, and curiosity, I think, undergird and are foundational to anybody collaborating, any one person. Because you asked what any one person can do. I think bring those three things to the table and you'll have a good collaboration. Mm, what a excellent place to say goodbye to our conversation today, Jim. I've really enjoyed the time today that we've spent. You've certainly brought some very novel and unique and valuable perspectives to this collection of conversations that is Brave UX. Thank you for sharing your stories and insights with me today and also for your generous contributions to the field over the past 15 years. Well, well thanks for having me and, and thanks for listening. Uh, I, I really appreciate the... Uh the questions and I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in. Oh, you're most welcome, Jim. And Jim, if people want to keep up to date with you and the workshops that you run, I know you're doing a lot of jobs to be done, uh, workshops and training in this space as well. What's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I think, first of all, you can find me out on LinkedIn. Uh, I love to connect with other UX folks out on LinkedIn. Uh, Jim Callback. I think it's Jim Callback. Yeah, you'll find me out on LinkedIn. Um, but also the Jobs to be Done Toolkit, so jtbdtoolkit.com. That's the website that we launched at on the heels of, of my last book to kind of keep the conversation going. And like you said, there's some free downloads there. There's an online course. We also do live trainings there as well, too. I think there's also a free <laughs> monthly webinar that you're running. Yeah, yeah. We're doing that uh, right after Thanksgiving here in the U.S. We did the first, no, the last Tuesday of the month. Um, that we, it's more of a community call. It's not a, it's not really a webinar. Um, we've been having guests recently and I'll interview the guests and they'll share something, but it's really about the questions and, and what people uh, bring to the table. We call that jobs to be done untangled, uh, because there's a lot of confusion and myths and questions that people have about jobs to be done. So it's more about, Hey, let, let's come together and, and try to answer those together. Wonderful. All right. Check it out, people. Thanks, Jim. And to everyone that's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything that we've covered, including the Jobs to be Done toolkit and all the other ways that you can reach Jim, his LinkedIn profile, some links to his books as well, they'll be in the show notes. So please check those out. If you've enjoyed this conversation and you want to hear more conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX design and product management like Jim, Don't forget to leave a review on the podcast. Those are really helpful. Also, subscribe to the podcast so it turns up in your uh, podcast app on a weekly basis. And tell someone else, just one other person about the show, if you feel they would get value from these conversations at depth. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn. My profile is uh, is linked to at the bottom of the show notes or just search for Brendan Jarvis or head on over to my website, which is thespaceinbetween.co.nz. That's thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time, keep being brave.